All right. Welcome to another episode of PyTorch Community Voices. My name is Suraj Subramanian, and I'm a developer advocate at PyTorch. And uh, today we have joining us Philip Mayer, who is a uh, software engineer at Quonsite AI and has been a long-term contributor at PyTorch. Philip has is also the author of a library called Pystiche, which I think is a really cool pun on pastiche. And uh, uh, the library helps you do neural style transfers very easily. And today we're going to learn a little more about that. Um, welcome to the show, Philip. Yeah, thanks for having me. Great to be here. Um, so usually how we do the show is the first half is for you uh, to present. So the stage will be all yours. And uh, once your presentation is done, and uh, I know you have some pretty uh, interesting things lined up for us. And once that is done, we'll open the stage to uh, questions from the audience. And um, we'll just have it interactive over there from then on. And for those of us who are joining us um, for the first time on the show, uh, please leave your questions for Philip as he, uh, he presents in the chat. And we will get to that um, after he's done with the presentation. All right, Philip, um, are you ready to go? Yeah, I'm ready to go. OK. So, so, hopefully, you can all see my slides now. Um, yeah, so just to get this ball rolling, um, like Suresh already told uh, you, I'm going to talk about a library called Pytiche, and it's basically a library to, to do neural style transfer. there. And just on the surface of that, let's just define why is it called Pytiche. Suresh already like hinted a little bit at the, at the name and what is neural style transfer. For, for everyone that uh, does not know what this is, um, otherwise the presentation will be kind of, um, yeah, like mood for you if you um, if this is not known. Okay, so what is Pystee? So um, Pystee is basically a library completely built uh, upon PyTorch and it's fully compatible. And the name itself is basically a pun on the um, on the word pastiche. And I'm just going to read the the wiki definition. It's basically Pastiche is a work of visual art that imitates the style or character of the work of one or more other art. Unlike parody, pastiche celebrates rather than mocks the work. And this really captures what um, uh, pastiche or neural style transfer is really about. And let's look at some kind of intuition what this means um, on the next. So, like, um, I'm in a very good position to be able to explain what this library does with only three images and two arithmetic symbols. So it's basically, um, you have two images, one with a given content and one with a given artistic style, and you want to merge these two together. So basically, you have yeah this, this equation of images, and this is described by neural start. And um, during this talk, I'm going to show you how to do exactly this. So exactly this transformation that you see right here, um, how you can do this with Pystiche and how easy it is. Um, but before, and I'll, I'll explain a little bit about math that is going on behind this. And um, but I'm trying to keep it um, like civil for everyone who's not really read into the field or what. Um, so before we go into the, the more uh, detailed part, let's look a little bit about on the history of how uh, Pystiche came to be. So um, neural style transfer was my kind, my topic or like my, my, uh, yeah, my, my topic for, for my PhD work. And basically in early 2019, I started with work on, um, on neural style transfer. And I realized fairly quickly that there is no sufficient tooling to do this. Like there are a lot of um, deep learning frameworks and help for this and that, but for neural style transfer, there was just nothing. And so basically in early 2019, I already started to write some first scripts, but this was just only scripts for me and maybe for one of my colleagues, but nothing um, really substantial that could be called a library. Or and then, um, in later that year, basically the um, PyTorch summer came around, and 
this was basically like a turning point for me. I needed to decide, like there was some other stuff going on in my life and I needed to decide, do I really want to have this kind of library or don't I? And I decided to have this kind of library and put in the work. And over the course of one month, I basically created the first release, the 0.1 release for um, Istish. And it actually um, won honorable mention on this hackathon. Like this is place four to eight. Um, which I was kind of really proud of because um, there were over a thousand participants. So this was, um, yeah, good good thing to have. And basically, with that, um, I had some leverage to go to my supervisor and ask him, well, instead of just having this for me or like for for some other people around there, can we maybe publish this? And is it possible to have like a software package uh, as part of the, the PhD work? It turns out it is possible. And for some, some of you may not know it, but there is a journal called Journal of Open Source Software, in, in, in short, JOS, and they basically do exactly that. So if you um, have a, um, you, you get a, basically a software peer review, and they will publish your package if it adheres to, to their standard. And this was October last year. Um, and yeah, basically, I got Pistiche with the release 0.6.2 uh, published. So now um, it's not only possible for researchers to, to, to cite it, but it's basically also encouraged. So everyone that is researching can now like use this as a, um, a very secure way of, of doing their research without worrying about um, me putting some stuff in there that doesn't belong there. Fast forward a little to May this year. So the latest release is uh, 0.7.2. Um, and that's the release that we are going to um, base the, the presentation on. Like the, um, I'll have some live coding demo prepared for you. Um, and like I'm currently working on the 1.0.1 the release. And this should be coming in the next few months, but I don't want to like set a uh, specific date because yeah, it's always hard to keep. Okay, with some history in mind, let's let's look at the, the new style transfer again and just define some basic terms that we need to understand what's going on in a live demo. So these three images that you saw uh, earlier, they have names. Like, um, and the, the image that basically defines the content that you want to have, it's called the content image. Like, yeah, it's pretty clear what, what the name implies. The same for the style image, and the, the output is basically usually called output image, stylized image, like something uh, along these. And um, how is the, 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 um, the, the style transfer actually transformed? The style transfer is posed as an optimization. And if this, this equation on the bottom looks scary, it really isn't. It basically says the argmin operator says, OK, everything, try to minimize the argument behind me, which is called this big L in parameter of um, all three images that we see above, which is called the perceptual loss and minimize this perceptual loss with um, respect to the stylized image. And this is the, this is the, the only thing that we need to do um, to perform this neural style transfer. So it's a like, justified question to ask, why is it called neural? And why is it so much better than everything that, uh, that happened before? And the answer to that lies how this perceptual loss is structured. So before then, we basically based all the style transfer techniques, and this, this field is basically that emerged in the late um, 20, uh, 20th century. century. Um, so this is not new. But what is new is basically instead of having some handcrafted feature space that we're trying to um, do the style transfer from, um, the neural style transfer injects some neural nets, basically a CNN, um, into this loss function. And this is the basis that makes the style transfer so versatile, because you can basically take any two images and then just merge them together. But I don't want to go on on the, the theory anymore. Let's dive into um, coding demo and see for yourself. So one of the parts that um, that this oops run this first. Um, one of the parts that makes this um, style transfer really possible is basically um, you need to have a GPU. And this is why I'm doing this in Colab right now, because everyone has access to a GPU in Colab. So um, I will um, 
share this uh, notebook with you later. But um, with uh, a collab, you can run this this even if you don't have a GPU. And that's the, the, the point why we use it. OK, so um, what I saw, uh, just told you on the, on the slides is that um, we need to have this perceptual loss defined. And this is basically the core concept that we uh, need to have to perform this neural structure. And the first thing that we are going to do is basically to define this neural net that I uh, told you that is injected into this, um, uh, into this perceptual loss. And in Pastiche, this is done with a so-called multi-layer encoder. And it's called multi-layer encoder because you can access um, every intermediate uh, representation, which we will see we need in a moment. And in Pastiche, this is as easily as just call a uh, function on this um, Pastiche.eng module um, for the most used um, encoder architectures. For example, in this case, the VGG architecture, we uh, already provide um, default multi-layer encoders, and you don't need to provide anything for yourself. But the whole uh, library is versatile enough that you can basically inject everything um, that you want to do. Um, you see here, if you know the VGG architecture, there's nothing special in here. But um, we basically renamed the, the individual layers back from the um, standard sequential. So basically having like um, an increasing um, int index from 0, 1, and, uh, and so on to actually give them some names so we can work with them a little bit better. But um, this is on, like, the weights are still the, the exactly the same as in the reg regular, regular VGG net. OK, so if we have the multi-layer encoder, we can already start to define a perception. And what I'm going to show you for the, the perceptual loss is basically what um, the same perceptual loss that uh, started this whole field. Um, but you can basically play around with everything and just uh, pastiche is modular enough to, to just combine everything that you want to have. So um, we start off with the content loss. So the content loss is usually um, basically defined as it's in, in Pastiche, it's called feature reconstruction operator. And this feature reconstruction operator basically does nothing more than calculate the uh, MSE loss between the encodings of um, two images. And uh, as I said, we don't rely on the images themselves, but we rely on the uh, feature space that this multi-layer encoder provides us. And in this case, we want to do this on the um, uh, ReLU 4.2 layer. I will talk a little bit later why exactly these layers and um, why uh, it's different for style and content loss. But for now, let's just create uh, the content loss like this. And uh, just as that, we get um, our content loss back. And this is um, internally, for those who know uh, how this is built, um, this is basically just an um, uh, a special NN module, and it behaves exactly the way, and we will see in a moment that we can also just treat it that way. So the next step is to define the style loss. And as you see here, uh, before we did um, this feature reconstruction operator on the ReLU 4.2 layer, but now um, we have a, a little bit of a special case. We, for the style uh, loss, we want to um, use multiple representations uh, from different layers. And in Pastiche, this is still fairly easy. You have this container operator called multi-layer encoding operator. In this case, you only provide the multi-layer encoder, you provide the layers that you want to have, and you need to provide the operator that you want to use for all these layers. In this case, we use the gram operator, which is basically just um, intuition-wise, basically calculating the correlation between the individual channels of the representation. And what you also see here is, um, is a score weight. So basically, um, since the content and the style loss are adversarial to each other, you can like imagine if the content loss is zero, then the style loss like content loss is zero. That means that the the image that you put in is exactly the content image, which means that the style is um, not fulfilled at all. And at the same time, if the style loss would be zero, that means that the style is fulfilled uh, fulfilled one hundred percent, which means that the content um, is not. Uh, uh, good anymore. So these two are adversarial, so we need to weight them uh, against each other, and this is just done by the score weight. So, and with this, we just uh, get our default um, uh, style loss back. So um, this 
it just shows us we have uh, these five layers. We have the gram operator. Each gram operator has a score weight one, which is correct in this case. We um, didn't weight them at all, but we said, okay, well, this whole style loss should have the score weight of one compared to the um, content. Okay, and that's basically it. We can just throw these both uh, content losses now into a um, class called perceptual loss that basically bundles them together. And you already see it here with this dot CUDA call. That's basically what you also do on um, default NN modules. You can just move everything with this call to the GPU and don't need to worry about like putting anything like manually to the GPU or whatever. And that's basically it. This is the whole definition of the perceptual loss in Pistiche. And so we can all, already almost start with the uh, neural structures. OK, so what do we need to do? We need to load some images, which uh, Pistiche provides some for you. But uh, of course, you can inject any image that you want. Um, in this case, we're just starting off with the, with the parrot and this uh, splash of paint that you already saw on my slides. And um, as a last pre preliminary step, we basically need to familiarize this uh, perceptual loss with the images that we just loaded. So we just tell the perceptual loss to use the content image as content image and the style image as style image. And as a last step, we need to um, yeah, set a starting point for this optimization. And it's usually a good idea to start from the content image because uh, in that case, the uh, style transfer converges a lot quicker. But you could also start um, from a um, random image. OK, and now we're completely set. And we can just use this provided image optimization function where we put in the starting point, perceptual loss, and the amount of steps that we want to uh, perform the optimization. And this is now running. And this takes some time to run, like on a GPU, about a minute for the settings that we're using. Um, you get some um, info output. But let's, let me just tell you a little bit about what this function actually does. So this, like I said, this is just a convenience function. You can just basically replace it with a default optimization loop that you know from any other training that you did with. So there's like everything that is in here is basically 100% compatible with, with uh, vanilla PyTorch, and you don't need to worry about anything. It's just for um, the default image optimization, usually you only uh, set these two um, parameters and then you go. And this is why we have this, this function, this, this convenience function. OK, let's see how far it come, came. We are already at step 350. And you see, um, especially in the beginning, you can see this adversarial behavior, like content loss is actually um, starting to rise. So this means the, the content is actually um, going to be degraded for the first few steps. But you see the, uh, the style loss is actually uh, yeah, like getting lower by quite a bit. So in the end, this should be fine. And if you look at the later steps, then you see the content loss is already also going down again, which means the uh, optimization found a good um, spot. And that's it. So this is the whole, the whole optimization that you have. So basically, if you now show the image, you see the stylized parrot that you already saw. And at this point, you can basically ask yourself, OK, so this is, this is awesome. And I, I would totally agree with you, um, th this technique of, of um, image optimization. But it kind of takes long. And it requires some amount of GPU power to just compute it. Can we maybe make this a little easier? Can we make this um, faster? And the answer is yes. And I didn't came up, came up with this. It was other researchers. But basically, you go to the different paradigm, which is called model optimization. Model optimization means, OK, let's just put um, a single, like train a, a neural net for us to perform the study. And I'm going to uh, showcase a little bit about this um, model optimization here, but we're not going to be like doing an actual training because this takes a couple of hours. What you basically have is Pistiche defines some transformer, was it called? Basically, you put in an image and you get out um, the stylized image. I'm not going to um, go through this net, but basically, this is just a default conf net um, with, with some uh, special, like, th there is nothing special in there that is. Um, related to Pistiche. So basically, this just defines um, uh, just the regular stuff that you uh, can find. Into. 
uh, in PyTorch. Okay, so yeah, I said we we don't want to um, we don't want to train ourselves, but I provided some sample weights, and now um, let's see how this works. We basically try to do this from the same content image again and use this as an output uh, as an input image and just put this image transformer. And as you said, maybe hopefully you saw it. Like just with the click of the button, this this uh, cell is all. So if we um, now show the result, you see, well, this was stylized. And you can see this 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 um, paint pattern that you have in the background, but of course the uh, like the, the quality is not as high as any. But this comes comes with a, uh, like this comes with a um, special um, price, and this is basically this is super fast and. Let's look how fast this is. Like, we can just measure it. And you see, it took, like, on this GPU on CUDA, with all the, the back and forth going on, this just took about 60 milliseconds to um, stylize it. So we're getting fairly close to do this. In so, what if you don't have a, CPU, a GPU? Let's try this all this uh, on, on the CPU. And this is basically. Uh, a little slower it will take about like two two point five seconds on the CPU. So this um, this this time it function basically runs this in multiple times. So this is why it takes like ten or fifteen seconds to run. Okay, two point nine seconds, but still manageable on the CPU. You won't do like you won't be able to do live inference uh, with this on the CPU, but at least um, this is a, a way for you to do side transfer if you have tr uh, a train transfer. Okay, and as a last, like this is basically showcasing the the, the minimal stuff that Pystich can do. Pystich can do a lot more, but um, there's no time for the presentation. But there is one more thing that I want to show off, and it's basically um, trying to use this to apply um, like this model that we had before. Apply this in real time, and. This is just me. Like I need to do this in a in a custom notebook, and I, of course I can share the notebook with you. But um, in Colab, it doesn't let me access my webcam, and I need this for a, for um, this uh, demo. So you can mostly ignore the first two cells here. It's just um, defining some functions so I can in like inject my um, transformation into um, a live stream. But the, the important part that is like the part that's important for Pystich is basically down here. So the first part you already know from um, the demo I just did. We um, define a transformer that we saw before, and we load the same weights that we saw before. And now um, we just define the transformation that we want to have. Like our transformation that we could put in the, into this uh, live stream is basically a pillow image in and a pillow image out. The only thing that we're doing is basically we're using the Default torch vision transformations to turn pillow image into a tensor. Uh, this is this line, and move it to the GPU. And on the last line is basically uh, move it back to the CPU and back to a pillow image. And in between is basically just using our transformer, put this image in, transform it, and then it's up. Okay, so let's put this to a test. So this is, you should see me in the light in the notebook right now, and um, right is just the um, still image, but hopefully this should now work and as a live stream. So you can see me waving, and you have now um, a live image transformed by this neural net. So basically, it's showing you that this is very much capable of being um, real time. Um, of course, like the last thing that I want, want to say, you still see some pixels on here that um, do not work very well, and it's just because the um, there's need to do have some really intricate training um, for for these uh, models that um, to try to um, remove these artifacts because normally, like what what is happening right now is uh, Pill is just clipping the image um, at um, yeah, at, at the, the default limits, and the transformer created pixels that are outside the range, which basically clips them to the highest value. This is why you always see like very uh, bright green, blue, purple, red, or whatever. But yeah, 
that's it. That's my presentation of pastiche. And I'm hoping um, I can get some good uh, questions for you from you. Thank you so much, Philip. Thanks a lot, Philip. Yeah. Uh, that was that was a lot of fun. Um, for for those of us who are for those of you who are joining us now, um, we are speaking with Philip Meyer, who is a, a software engineer at Quantsight AI, and um, he uh, is also the author of the library we just presented to you about Pastiche. Um, Philip, if I can summarize, please correct me if I'm wrong, but if I can summarize what neural style transfer is, is that there are three images that um, play uh, play a role over here. You have the content image, the, the image that you're going to be transforming. You have the style image, the image that contains the style you want to apply to your content image. And finally, you have your target image, which is what the model is going to generate as an output. And, yes. uh, and the losses are calculated based on, there are two kinds of losses, content and style loss, which is then aggregated as a perceptual loss. And um, that loss is optimized. Basically, NS, NST is an optimization problem where yes. we are uh, trying to minimize this aggregated perceptual loss uh, to create a target image that has features of the content, but also is stylistically similar to the style image. Yes. So, like, and this default configuration, you just have one content loss, one style loss. But there are papers out there, and Pastiche supports it to use multiple content losses, multiple style losses. If you want. And there is one other category. It's called regular uh, regularization, which is also possible on these images. For example, what I just explained with these artifacts that you saw on the live stream, you could try to put a loss in there to just try to minimize this. But this has nothing to do with the, the content or style in itself. It just tries to keep the image in a certain range or tries to, to avoid like checker point um, patterns or whatever. This is also kind of loss and Pistiche supports a few of those. So. All right. That's that's really interesting. Um, I have to tell, I have to let everyone know that all of my understanding about neural style transfer uh, comes from reading the docs on Pistiche and actually playing around with uh, the modular blocks. Um, I, I really like I like how well um, it's designed because it just makes it more clear like what are the uh, functional blocks when we are talking about neural style transfer. So um, I would recommend everyone to check it out. It took me less than 15 minutes to get set up, and within in 30 minutes I was playing around. Uh, and just blending different kinds of images and just having fun with it. Um, so, Philip, good we'll, yes, we'll we'll start with questions from the audience. Kush has a question. Um, he asks, yeah. "What happens when we set content and style images of different sizes? Does Pistiche do any intelligent resizing, or does it raise an error?" Um, uh, depends. So, you can. The only two images that have to have to have the exactly the same size are the content image and the output image. So if you just start from the content image, then you're fine. You can you can't do anything bad at this point. But if you just generate a random image or whatever, you need to make sure that the content image and the output image have the same shape. And yes, it will be if this is not happening, then of course it will raise an error. But for the style image, you don't actually need the same shape because um like I need to get a little bit about in, into the theory because um, the style image is like the style is actually represented with uh, with texture features internally. Like um, this gram matrix, for example, is is a texture feature. But um, what this does is basically it completely discards the spatial information, tries to um, reduce the information like away from the spatial side. Because imagine if you have a style image where some style element that you um, want to synthesize in the output image is on the in, on the bottom left corner, and you don't want to don't want this uh, like don't want the style image to appear on the bottom left corner if it would fit on the uh, top right corner a lot better. So the whole point of having the style loss is to discard the spatial information. Because they're doing that, you don't actually need to have um, the same size, but. Um, one problem is though, like the, the size of the image is basically going uh, like grows the memory requirement and the runtime requirement quadratically. 
and this is why I, we usually keep these um, these sizes in like around 500 pixels or whatever on the small. If you have a really large GPU, of course you can. But um, everything else needs adjustment because the, the the layer that you the layers that you pick to um, form or like to calculate the perceptual loss are also somewhat dependent on the the, the image size because um, the these layers on in this VGG net, for example, they are trained for a specific image size. So, for example, um, to recognize um, like for VGG, this, this size is uh, 224 pixels. So, if you put in a lot larger pixels, this VGG net will have problems to recognize the concept, which are um, the, 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 the interesting parts for, for this. So, of course, play around with these images, but then make sure to also play around with these layers, because otherwise we'll maybe uh, see not really good result. Thank you, Kush, for that question. That was pretty interesting. I did not realize that the style image is not dependent, not spatially dependent. Um, Tyrone has a question. Um, he wonders, what's the advantage of using Pystiche versus doing it manually? If I may just interject over here, Tyrone, you should really try doing this manually. And yeah, <laughs> there's so much so boilerplate just, that you have to write. Yeah. So just to like, because I, I was asked this question a lot and I asked myself this question a lot. Is it even like, is it useful to have a library like this? And I, I have a usage example in my documentation, which basically details exactly that. So the one example, the, 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 the most Easy example that I show, can showcase with Pystiche is, is just that, what I, I just did. And you can find this in the, the beginner examples of my documentation. But you can also try exactly the same output and get, getting exactly the same output without using Pystiche and just doing boilerplate torch. And then you will see how, um, how many stuff is going on in the background that the user actually don't want to see because it's just, they don't want to care how to get the intermediate re, uh, uh, responses from from the uh, from the multi-layer encoder. They just want it to work, and that's the power of Pystiche to make everything flexible and um, yeah, hide all this complexity without without like reducing the flexibility. Like you still have the flexibility to use any kind of multi-layer encoder and use any kind of loss, and still it is super simple to to define your own losses or your own multi-layer encoder. Thank you, Tyrone, for that question. In fact, Philip, uh, the one striking thing was how well designed and how modular Pystiche is. Um, I'm, I was wondering how, um, like, what were your considerations when you were designing Pystiche? And I think Sudo Maze also has a very similar question. Thank you, Sudo Maze, for posting. Um, he yeah. asked, how did you develop the library? What was the process? And yeah, so this was, it? yeah, this is, um, this was this was kind of a really important learning process because back then when I started I was like research assistant or graduate student and like I don't have a software developer background just so developing this library is actually what got me into software and all the stuff that I know today about software engineering be it unit testing how CI works or how how you can build a good documentation, how to do this and how to do that. It's basically just all coming from the project, just to encourage everyone to, to try and do some stuff if you have a good idea. Like This actually got me pretty far. But um, to get back, like the design principles, if I, um, at first, I looked at the, the implementations of style principles because like, this is so, like the, the topic is so, vivid like everyone wants like it's super easy to like explain on the surface there are like thousands of implementations out there. but when i look through them the point that everyone is, um was uh, having is easier either they had really really fixed um fixed stuff in there so you can use only one style loss you can only use one content loss maybe you can change the layers but this is this is it that the multi-layer uh, encoder is fixed. Everything was fixed. This is um, in this case you had a simple UI, but everything was fixed, and you can't change anything. Or there were implementations that basically said, "Well, okay, you can you find everything yourself?" But then the UI was really not um, in a good state, so it was really complicated. And my idea was to, well, I wanted to make my 
life easier. Like I did this as a PhD student. I didn't want to write this boiler code plate boilerplate code over and over again. So my idea was, okay, well, can I make it modular enough so I can just swap out any pieces that I want? Like, for example, if you just recall the, the notebook, there is no connection, like no direct connection between the multi-layer encoder and the perceptual loss. If you just decide right now that I that you don't want to use VGG19 and use like a ResNet or whatever, you can just put it in. Of course, you need to change the layers that... Uh, that will be uh, used to extract the, the encodings from, but that's it. And stuff like this was not possible with any other library that I've And this is basically why I started to, to develop ISD. So about unit testing, well, this was also quite a learning curve. But at the same time, I tried to, like, I um, started to develop ISD. I started to contribute to Torch Vision. And so this was my first contact with unit tests. So I've, like I said, I've never, I don't have a software developer background, so um, I didn't know what unit tests were until I opened my first PR and someone told me, well, you need to add tests. And so the, the first PRs were kind of lengthy, but um, um, the folks over at Torch Vision, they were fairly helpful. And I finally got the first PR in, uh, PRs in and then I looked at the first stuff like, okay, what is unit testing? How does how does this work? How is AI working? And so I just used my knowledge that I gained on Torch Vision to basically um, try to build my own CI pipeline. And then over the time, I've hit a lot of problems that I didn't think through before. And um, yeah, so yeah, this was just uh, kind of an interesting journey for me to to learn about all this stuff just by doing it, like. In the first place, it's just okay. Well, let's start it with the boiler. Let's start it with the code. And then, well, this broke again. Why did it break again? And then, after some time, you realize, okay, well, it would be nice if this is, could be checked for every commit that I do. Okay, well, there is CI. Let's put CI on there and try to do unit tests. So this is like an iterative, um, an iterative approach. If you, I mean. Pythesh is completely public. If you look at the, the 0 0.1.0 release, there is not a lot of testing going on. Basically, a lot of bad engineering practices because I just didn't know better. But I, hopefully, this is a lot better now. And I'm still still learning every day, but um, trying to keep this up to date. That's that's super inspiring, man. Uh, if, if you did not have a background in software developer, what was your background in? Uh, before you started on this? Um, I actually did my bachelor's in electrical engineering, and then I did my master's in uh, mechatronic engineering. But then I... I really required as well. Uh, again, please say... Uh, and nothing related to art. No, 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 no. Nothing related to art. Yeah, it, it was it was kind of journey when my, my, my supervisor came with me to, with this topic. And the first two or three weeks, I was basically reading, like, art uh, stuff which was kind of like I, with my with my um, way that I went until this point, art was never playing a role in my life because I like after school I was I, I'm got, get, getting into engineering because this is what this was my passion and um, so art was never a point for me where this is uh, where this was interesting and so I then had to read like literature about art and it was. Quite an interesting experience if you just read like for five years only engineering literature. That is a very cool journey, Philip. Yeah. In in fact, um, this is not a question, but um, I totally uh, second this suggestion. You should really share your experience of um, developing a pastiche in a blog post. I'm sure that will make a really good read. Yeah, I can do that. Put it on my to do list. Thanks, uh, Sudomis, for that suggestion. Um, I want to uh, bring up Kush's second question. What motivated you to use PyTorch for this? Yeah, so this is also like a fairly easy answer. I I, um, I developed a little bit about uh, with Heffy and TensorFlow before that, but they like from my perspective, they were really clunky. And this was before TensorFlow 2.0, so they didn't have any eager execution or whatever. And then when the, when the time 
same. I just put in my in my um, in my search bar basically neural style transfer and tutorial. And the first thing that popped up was actually the official PyTorch tutorial about it. And I was like, okay, well, just click a few links and look through it. And the first time I read this, and I was like, wait, this is so easy. Like, why? Like, coming from a TensorFlow background, this feels like it, it felt like just too easy. And then I just downloaded the example and executed it, and I was like, what? I can debug every step. Like, eager execution is a thing here. And it's just this, I was sold at this moment. And um, after seeing how flexible um, the Torch and N um, module is and how I can inject basically everything that I want in there, because like the whole perceptual loss and multi-layer encoder is just based on um, this NN module class. And it being so um, configurable just makes Pystiche possible. Like I'm not saying it's not possible to do the same in, in TensorFlow, but this was just um, amazingly um, pleasant to write. And like 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 I uh, told, um, I was sold the minute that uh, that I read the first tutorial, and yeah. So since then, I've I've never looked back. Like um, maybe I can do the same, or maybe you can like it is possible in TensorFlow, but yeah, I've never considered going uh, anywhere else. Thank you, Kush, for that question. That's a question that we usually ask our guests towards the end, but uh, I thought this was a fitting time to bring that in. And Tyrone says that uh, he enjoys using PyTorch for the same reason. And Tyrone, you're not alone. Um, I count myself as a fan of the extensibility and the really nice API uh, in PyTorch. I wanted to also bring up a question. Oh. Yeah, so the feedback by Kush. Yeah, I agree. It is pretty yeah. amazing. Yeah. Um, so Sudo has asked a question about your future work. Um, oh, what's next for Pystiche? Um, so high quality GANs, it's GANs like are a, a little bit different from style transfer because it's not as easy to define what you actually want to have. But there are papers out there that um, combine these two techniques, and they um, achieved amazing results. Um, so I can't really talk about artreader.com because I don't know it, but I can look at it uh, later, and I can just um, message you somehow. So, um, but what's next for Pystiche? Um, yeah, so with the zero point one point zero point zero release, there will be some changes that I made internally to make this even a little a little easier in some parts, but um, nothing that is like super groundbreaking or whatever. I just wanted to get it to a stable state finally. And then I think the most important part for me is to get people who are not really into like programming or basically not into um, if, like if, if they don't know Python, then they basically can't use Pystiche. And my idea is basically, how can I bring Pystiche to people who don't want to get into the backend? Like Pystiche is able to, to handle, is flexible and can do all this stuff. But for someone who doesn't want to code, is it possible to uh, for them to, to use Pystiche? And I have a few um, ideas in mind, but um, for example, I want, I desperately want to have like a web interface or whatever that you can just use and define your stuff in there. And there's, I already have some ideas how to do that, but this will be just the next uh, path of my journey because I don't know anything about web development. And so, um, yeah, the web interface will probably be a little clunky in the beginning, but um, Hopefully, I can get it to a state that is enjoyable for it. But on the same note, like I'm always looking for contribution. So if someone has good web development, like someone is listening here and <laughs> has uh, uh, time and leisure to, to contribute, I'm, I'm looking for someone who um, does web development to yeah, achieve this uh, together with me. By the way, Philip, uh, there is an app Streamlit, and um, uh, which which really helps you build UIs out of your machine learning models. 
Um, this yeah, I've heard about this. this. You might want to go check out. Yeah, it's not that easy because the, pro the problem that I have um, for regular like regular people usually they don't have a GPU, and besides having this this pre-trained models uh, for with model optimization in this paradigm, um, it is really not uh, sufficient to run this stuff on CPU. No one is going to use it just with CPU. So, um, like, I imagine if we, maybe it's possible to um, connect this, like, my, my idea is about is just have a web UI that basically spins up a cloud instance with a, a GPU on it, and someone, like, it should be, like, deployable locally. If you have a GPU, use the web interface and you're good. But if you don't have a GPU, maybe we can have some kind of payment model, like, whatever, 20 cents, or uh, you transform an image, and then you don't have a G you don't need to have a GPU. You can just use the web interface. But this is, like, so far in the future, it's, it's, it's hard, to, hard to do. But, like, I've looked into Streamlit, but, yeah, the problem is I can't expect everyone that I want to use this, that, that I think should use this library to have a GPU. And that's kind of a limiting factor in my idea. Right. Um, we are close to the end of our stream. I want to wrap up with one final question, Philip, just to switch gears out of uh, Pyastish. What is the one thing that you are super fascinated about in machine learning? Hmm. Honest, that's hard to pin down. Like <laughs> you, you should have prepared me for this question, so maybe <laughs> I can. Ah, uh, yeah, sorry for that curveball. I know no, this no, no, is the one from, right? Yeah. No, this is this is this is hard to choose. Like in the last few years, for me in my field, I think Gans like where they they the most exciting. And when I read, uh. Yeah, <laughs> I mean that's that's what I'm working right now. But it's hardly machine learning, but maybe machine learning infrastructure. But no, like I think when I read this paper about combining side transfer with GANs, I was just completely amazed. And I encourage everyone to read it. Maybe I can share it somehow later. Um, they basically the results that they achieved were so remarkable that um, they actually tested like try to um, uh, present their results to actually art critics and tell, told them, like, okay, these are three images. One of them is not by the painter, but was generated by us. Please tell us which one. Like a and, and, like, yeah, basically. And they were just scoring, like, if I like, have it correctly in my mind, they like just moved the, the art critics in 30, 40% of the time. And so this is just, this was just truly amazing to to read and yeah this this was my my highlight in the, in the last uh, i think it's 2018 or 2019 the paper i'm not um sure right now but yeah this was super amazing to to, to see to well like um machine we usually apply like um assume that machine learning is only capable of doing stuff that is well defined in an algorithm but seeing these algorithms to just like take a handle on a on a, a topic like art, which is basically in 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 every understanding just reserved for humans because we don't see um, algorithms to be creative or whatever, and then just whip out an algorithm that can just fool art critics into believing that this was actually created by a human. Yeah, that, that was amazing to see from. Um, I know I mentioned that this was the last question, but I think I'm going to cheat a little because this is this is pretty interesting. Uh, have you looked into spiking neural networks? Um, no, I didn't. Like I n know a little bit about what they are, but I've never like I've never re read a paper about using them in uh, in research transfer. And since I'm not actively researching anymore this is not um i've i've not looked into this but thanks for the suggestion i will maybe this is the next thing for pastiche all right um thank you so much philip for uh, taking the time out today to talk to us about your library this was really fun and the audience agrees 
And uh, That's good. Uh, yeah, this was this was really good. Thank you for uh, thank you for being here today. And um, folks, if you enjoyed this discussion, um, I definitely recommend you try out Pastiche. Um, let me just put the repo URL. So that's how you get to the UR, the repo. Start it, fork it, uh, definitely try it out. It's a lot of fun. I spent my entire work day playing around with this. Uh, I recommend doing it after hours when you don't have too much to do because it can get really fun. Um, all right, um, thanks for joining us uh, today. And next week, please uh, uh, join us at the same time. Um, all right, see you until then. Thanks, Philip. See ya.